Good evening, everyone. My name is Fritz Schroeder, and on behalf of the Lancaster Conservancy, welcome to Nature Hour. Lancaster Conservancy's mission is to provide wild and forested lands and clean waterways for our community forever. We were founded in 1969 by a small group of hunters, anglers, and naturalists who banded together to acquire and protect our critical forests, wetlands, and streams with the belief that some land is so beautiful, so rare, and so natural, it should be protected for public benefit forever. Today, over 5,000 acres and 40 miles of trails are open for you and I to enjoy 365 days per year thanks to their incredible vision. The urgency that drove our founders continues today as we accelerate our efforts to strategically protect and restore more fragmented forests, to expand and connect our existing preserves and to create new preserves, all the while building out infrastructure and parking lots, trails and signage that allow access for public while also protecting these incredible ecosystems. We launched Nature Hour this past summer with the goal of bringing an assortment of local and regional experts directly to your home with presentations that help you better understand both the Conservancy's work and the work of our community partners. While you may not be able to draw a straight line between the work of the Lancaster Conservancy and Rodale Institute, we, we see and understand the complex importance of our joint ecosystems. Our soils play a very key role in our region's long-term sustainability and our one solution to our complex climate issues. Tonight is the third of six nature hours taking place this winter and spring. Additional nature hours include oysters in a clear bay with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation on February 24th, made in the shade, gardening with shade loving natives with Mount Cuba Center on March 10th. There and back again, a migrant's tale with Hawk Mountain Sanctuary on March 24th. You can learn more and pre-register for these lectures on our website, lancasterconservancy.org under upcoming events. The Conservancy is blessed with incredible corporate support. And tonight we wanna to recognize our annual sponsors, Clark Associates, Electron Energy, Ritu Associates, Penn Stone, and Nimblest. Thank you to these local companies for your commitment in supporting the Lancaster Conservancy's work. And now I'm going to turn the program over to our engagement coordinator, Keith Williams. Welcome, Keith. Hey, thanks, thanks, Fritz. And thank you all for spending part of your Wednesday evening with us. Um, as Fritz said, you know, the, the, the land that we protect forever as the Conservancy is part of a much larger working landscape that includes agricultural land use and suburban land use and urban land use. And uh, all of that's connected. So what we do on conservancy lands has an effect on that larger landscape and vice versa. What happens on that larger landscape affects conservancy preserves. And something that's coming to the surface here recently that affects all of those lands is the concept of, of soil health and the implications that soil health has for climate resilience and climate stabilization. And tonight we have this uh, renowned expert in, in regenerative agriculture and soil health Dr. Yi Chao Ray is a soil scientist at Rodale Institute. He oversees soil health research, supporting all short and long-term projects at Rodale. He also leads outreach initiatives to educate the public on the benefits of improving soil health. Yi Chao holds a BS in biology from Nankai University and dual PhDs in microbial ecology and soil science from the University of Chinese Academy of Sciences and Griffith University. Before joining Rodale, Yi Chao worked in the University of Western Australia and the University of Wisconsin-Madison on a variety of projects evaluating the impacts of climate change, land use, and management strategies on soil organic matter stability, nutrient cycling, and microbial activity. He is particularly interested in understanding the resp responses of soil microbial regulated carbon and nitrogen cycles to climate change and land use, identifying better management practices to improve environmental stability and resilience is the ultimate goal of his research. Dr. Ray, thank you so much for uh, joining us tonight to share some, uh, some of your knowledge. Oh, well, thanks, Keith. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining tonight's session. So tonight, let's talk about regenerative agriculture and planetary health. But before we get started, let me ask you a question. Where are our food from? Our food are from the farms, right? From the soil, directly or indirectly. But how 
do we produce our food? Food production is a natural thing, right? Plants grow. We get the fruits, the grains, or the roots. We eat them. But in the last 100 years, we have been growing food more and more unnaturally. So since the beginning of the 20th century, or even as early as the mid 1800s, we've been applying a lot of synthetic chemical inputs into the soil to produce food. These input including synthetic fertilizers to feed the plants, also the pesticides and herbicides to get rid of the insects and the weeds. And that's what we call the industrial or chemical agriculture, also characterized by things like physical disturbance, disruptions like heavy use of tillage to prepare the seed bed or condition, condition the seed bed or get rid of the weeds. These uh, characteristics of industrial and chemical, chemical agriculture are usually uh, accompanied with large operations of monocrop, monocrop, just corn and soybeans, right? However, whatever we want to call it, the degenerative agriculture or, or industrial or uh, unsustainable agriculture, what happens is that when you put on these different practices in, onto our soil, there are consequences. We produce our food, in the meantime, soil degradation happens. And also there's a decline in soil organic matter and soil organic carbon content, decline in long-term soil fertility and soil structure. And also we see things like the loss of biodiversity and ecosystem services like watershed health. And in the long-term, we may face things like food shortage, malnutrition and political unrest that are caused by uh, the degenerative agriculture. So actually up to now, there's already one third of earth's soil that's acutely degraded due to agriculture. That's a serious problem. And that's why last year in the year of 2020, the BBC put on a special pro program focusing on why soils are disappearing from the farms. And this is, is especially important for, for the global uh, civilization because the global agricultural regions are much, more lar much larger than urban and built up areas. So the total global agricultural region is about 51 million square kilometers. Well, the total urban and the build up areas in the globe is only about 1.5 million. So that's a big comparison. If we impose all these unsustainable degenerative practices onto all those, these large areas of croplands, there will be consequences coming to the urban and build up areas. So some of the things we are familiar with, for example, you may heard of you have heard of the Dust Bowl, which was in the 1920s and 1930s. But if you think that was just the past, you will be wrong. And it's still happening. This is Dust Bowl 2.0. It's still happening in the United States and in other countries too. For example, here's a picture from Beijing in the early 2000s. You can see that people are wearing masks, not because of pandemic, that was much earlier than the pandemic. That's just for um, preventing their get the pollution from the air. So that's everywhere around the globe. And also we have all these erosions and runoffs happening across the globe's farms. These uh, erosions will cause sediments and pollution coming into our waterway. For example, here, the local uh, creeks and brooks in the Lehigh Valley area. In the winter time, if the farm areas, uh, farmlands are not covered, then after a big storm, there will be huge runoff going to the local stream, the creek, Lehigh River, and then to the Delaware River, to Lancaster and the Chesapeake Bay area. And here's another picture from China. 
because I was born in China. I witnessed the environmental degradation in happened in China in the 1990s. So I was kind of, you know, uh, want to use more e examples from uh, these two large countries. So here's a picture from uh, Nanchang where kids have been spending some time in. So this area actually it's in a, uh, in part of China where a lot of forests are uh, abundant. So uh, land degradation and erosion shouldn't happen in that part of China. It should happen more in the lowest plateau in the Northern China, but it is now happening in this part of China. So it's a global issue and, and it's becoming more and more serious. And what's more, we have all those chemicals that just mentioned to feed the crops, to get rid of the pesticide, get rid of the insects and weeds. So when we apply all these agricultural chemicals, because the low use efficiency of the fertilizers, uh, about more than 50% of these fertilizers, MPK, will eventually end up in local water, waterways and cause problems like eutrophication of of lakes and streams. Oh, so here's a picture. Can you guess where it is? So this is my first stop in the United States. I came to the United States in 2017. This is Madison, Wisconsin. I worked in the University of Madison, Wisconsin uh, for a year and a half before joining Rodell Institute. So it's beautiful, right? In the summertime, wonderful, fantastic, like a heaven. But if you know Madison, it's surrounded by four lakes. If you look at the lakes in the summertime, that's another issue. The lake, the water are so green. A lot of dead fish in this water. That made my you know, first impression not, uh, not so ideal. So here are a lot of you know, dead fish. People like fishing, but they, they don't eat the fish they, they catch. That's because you know, they know there's serious pollution happening in their waterways. And Professor Todd Miller is from UW Milwaukee. His lab has algae samples from all around the globe, from lakes in everywhere. But he found the highest level of algae is from his home in Wisconsin. So that's ironic. And it's not just causing problems in the local regions. It's also causing problems in regional scales, for example, our Great Lakes are in danger right now. This is uh, an issue of National Geographic, uh, maybe two months ago. And I've been reading this issue with my boys lately. So it's really about this, the severe consequences from the farms around this area and the problems and causing to the communities in this global, uh, in this Great Lakes region. Also, it can be global problem. All the streams and the lakes and the pollution will eventually go down to the Gulf of Mexico and creating a dead zone that everybody has heard of. So these are the consequences causing uh, problems uh, affecting our water resources. And the climate crisis. We've heard about that climate crisis. It's happening right now. And why is that related to soil? Why is that related to farming? We know that soil has organic matter in it. So organic matter contains a lot of carbon and nitrogen, phosphorus, these, uh, these elements. So the thing is that global soil carbon is a big pool of carbon the elements. If you look at the carbon contained in the terrestrial soil, down to one meter, you can see there's about 1500 petagrams of carbon in the global soils, more than the atmosphere carbon and global vegetation car carbon put together, put together. So there's a lot of carbon contained in there in our soil. That's why you see soil with high organic matter, high carbon content as a darker color. But soil can be a sink of carbon, also a source of carbon. So carbon in the soil, so soil organic carbon stock is about the balance between input 
and output. If there's more input than output of carbon, then soil is uh, a sink. But if the output of carbon is greater than the input, then soil becomes a carbon source contributing to the climate problems. So according to IPCC, we can see that the agriculture contributes to about a quarter of the global greenhouse gas emissions. So that's a lot. Agriculture has been, has been part of this problem. If we want to mitigate climate change, we need to put those carbon back to the soil, draw down the atmospheric carbon dioxide content. content. And the climate crisis, we are now more and more familiar with that. This is in um, January in 2020. That was before the, pan early, the beginning of the pandemic. Everybody was you know, pay paying attention to the big fire in Australia, which lasted for many months. And then in July of 2020, we had big storms hitting the farms in the Midwest, for example, in Iowa, where there's a lot of lo loss of farm assets and, and the crops. So Bob Miller is 88 years old. He's a farmer, lifelong farmer in Norway, Iowa. So he's been farming for over 50 years in his hometown. He said, he's no scientist, but his life experience told him that climate change is here and this is it. Also, there are health issues associated with unsustainable or degenerative agricultural practices. So here's a list of the most contaminated crops. And in all these crops, these detectable pesticide residues have been found. And from um, a recent study con conducted in Switzerland on the farms across Switzerland, people found that even after 10 years of organic man management, the pesticide residues can still be detected. So these are affecting people's health. For example, these well-known uh, chemicals used to kill life, 2,4-D or Roundup, uh, glyphosate, these can be detected in farms even after a few years of organic management. So uh, with that, our human health has been affected. So this is the change of the, the uh, we can see that in the last a uh, few decades, there are more and more chronic diseases and disorders in the United States. For example, the reported autism cases has uh, skyrocketed, skyrocketed in the last few decades. And the nutrient density of food is declining as well. So here's a ratio of the food right now compared to um, 19, uh, the, the, the ratio of the nutrient content in 1999 to the nutrient, nutrient contained in the food in 1950. So if the ratio is below one, that shows the nutrient content is declining. So we can see these major uh, garden crops, we, we can see there's a decline of nutrient content compared to 50 years ago. For example, broccoli. In 1950, one gram of broccoli contained about 12.9 milligram calcium, but now it only contains about 4.4 milligram. So that means if you want to get the same amount of nutrition uh, uh, like uh, 50 years ago or 1950, you need, you need to eat about three times the food to get, to get these nutrients. Dr. Um, Bob Buman is a professor in food science in Penn State. His expertise is in this compound. It's a natural compound, an amino acid called ergothionine. It's a naturally occurring antioxidant. So we can get that from food, from grains or from uh, vegetables or from, you know, uh, mushrooms. But it's not synthesized by plants. 
plants cannot make this compound, this amino acid. It, it is only synthesized by fungi, by soil microorganisms, by fungi and by fungi-like bacteria. So bacteria, fungi and fungi-like bacteria synthesize these compounds in the soil and plants take up these uh, compounds and then human will be able to consume them. It has very strong anti-inflammatory effects and good, very good for very effective in cell repair. And it's, it's rich in mushroom because it's um, primarily produced by fungi. And what we can see is that in some countries where people consume more ergothionine, there's much greater life expectancy. For example, in like in Japan and Italy, and you can see that the United States, it's probably you know, in a in a uh, developed developed country, it's probably uh, one of the has the one of one of the smallest consumption daily consumption of this ergothionine. You you may want to say that oh in the United States the life expectancy is about you know eighty years old eighty years old that's not too bad, it's. Yeah, it's not too bad, but we know what's happening here. We want to improve, right? And also because we don't want to people suffer in their uh, old ages, right? We don't want to there suffer from things like Alzheimer, dementia, and the Parkinson's disease and rely on chemicals or prescription to extend their life expectancy, right? So you can see that when you consume more ergothionine, this amino acid, then you tend to have lower chance to get these uh, diseases. So with that, you can see that it's a big comparison in the expenditures uh, on food and healthcare uh, now compared to 1960. In 1960, the United States spent 74.6 million on, on food, and, but much less in healthcare. But right now in 2017, we spend much more on healthcare than on food. So that's now just the opposite. So we produced a lot of cheap food and then we need to spend a lot of money on healthcare and to, 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 to cure these diseases. So that's why Franklin Roosevelt said, the nation that destroys its soil destroys itself. So you can see all these problems. I started my presentation by, by you know, introducing all these problems related to soil degradation and unsustainable farming. Uh, I just want to let you know that we really need to rethink the way we produce our food. It's a biological process. Biology is, is what's the fundamental principle of food production. But what happened is that in the last century, we started to think, we thought that we could bypass this biological process. We could use things produced in the lab, the chemistry, the chemicals to bypass this process in, happening in the soil. We could ignore the microorganisms we could ignore, overlook the plant microbe interactions to produce food. Yes, global food production has increased a lot, but there are also a lot of problems accompanied with that achievement. Now we are paying a price. That's why we need to rethink the way we produce, produce our food more sustainably and regeneratively. Regen, regeneratively. Okay. Now I'm going to my second part of the presentation, regenerative agriculture, origins, principles, and the implementations. So let me start by introducing this person, Franklin, Franklin King. Dr. Franklin King, he was the founder of the Department of Soil Science of the University of Wisconsin Medicine, where I used to work. The building that we, I used to have an office is called the King Hall. He was also the, the, the manager of the division of soil management of USDA in early 
uh, to in early 1900s. And then he was he he was kind of you know uh, questioning in a very early time in early 1900s. He's questioning why we use a lot of chemicals in our very rich prairie derived soils in the United States, but the soil seems to be depleting that time. He was also interested in why, how those Asian countries could sustain high density of population without depleting the soil. So in 1911, he paid a visit to China, Korea, and Japan for about six months. And after he came back, he wrote a book called Farmers of 40 Centuries or Permanent Agriculture in China, Korea, and Japan. That time there was no uh, word organic. Organic was not introduced that time. So he used the word permanent agriculture to reflect his thoughts on how to sustainable, sustainably farm without depleting the soil. You can see that in his book, he put to some, took some pictures from China. For example, here on the right up, uh, above, so you can see these compost piles where people utilize their life waste and everything, for example, including the plant litter from the leaves to make compost and put them back onto the soil. So that was 19, 1911, 1911, very early. And that was also a time that chemical industrial agriculture gradually becoming more mainstream. And then starting from 1920s, there are some important thinkers of um, alternative agriculture started to propose the alternative ways of farming. For example, Sir Albert Howard in the UK, Rudolf Steiner in Germany and Lady Balfour in the UK. So uh, Sir Albert Howard, he spent some time in India. So he also observed how the farmers in, in India was able to utilize the life waste and put them back to the soil to enrich the soil. Rudolf Steiner proposed the term biodynamic agriculture. And in the United States, J.I. Rodell started to experiment with organic farming in the 1930s and founded the Rodell Institute in 1947 and Rodell Press, the publishing company in 1942. So that's how the organic farming, the organic agriculture movement started in the United States. Also, you are more familiar with Rachel Carson, who wrote the book, The Silent Spring in the 1960s, warning people the consequence of chemicals used in uh, agriculture. So here's a little bit history about Rodale Institute. As I said, J.I. Rodale, he's widely recognized as the father of organic agriculture in the United States. He founded Rodale Press and the Rodale Institute, and he popularized the term organic agriculture by the magazines, including Organic Gardening and Farming and other uh, magazines and books. So we are located in Kutztown, Pennsylvania. So it's about an hour from Lancaster. And that's all where our headquarter is. But also we have three regional resource centers in Iowa, California, and Georgia. So we believe healthy soil equals healthy food and healthy people. That's how everything started in the United States. And then in 1970s, Jerry's son, Bob Rodale, he coined the term regenerative agriculture in the 1970s and early 1980s, because that was a time that everybody was talking about sustainable, sustainable agriculture. Then he asked if, you know, if the soil, if the resources are kind of, you know, already depleted, what do you want to sustain? To sustain is not enough. You need to regenerate. So regenerative is not just about sustain, but improve the soil to build a foundation for long-term food production. So the principle of regenerative agriculture includes eliminate chemicals to, to let the biology flourish, diversify crop rotations, don't just grow corn and soybeans only. 
maximize living cover through cover crops and perennials and maximize the photosynthesis carbon translocate to, translocated to the soil and use natural fertilizers such as compost and green manure as the source of fertility for, for the crops and reduce tillage and disturbance. But people at that time were still questioning Bob Rodell's uh, the, uh, thoughts about regenerative agriculture. People still thought that was just a fad. So then to prove that it's feasible, it's feasible. And Rodel Institute started a long-term trial called the Farming System Trial, which now I'm serving as a research director of. So the Farming System Trial or the FST started in 1981 is the longest running side-by-side -side comparison of organic and conventional farming system in North America. So it's been 40 years old. It has three systems, a conventional system that mimics the, the widely you know, uh, distributed uh, corn and soybean systems in large areas of the United States, a legume system, organic legume system, which uh, uh, relies on leguminous cover crop as nitrogen source and uh, organic manure system, which puts back the manure from the animals to the soil to as a source of fertility. So these three systems, they differ in their cash crop, cover crop, and amendment. For example, the conventional system is featured by um, very simple corn soybean rotation. That's uh, what you can see on the large areas of the United States. And it uses synthetic fertilizers as source of fertility and pesticides to control weeds and insects. Organic manure has a longer four-year rotation and it relies on leguminous cover crops to pro provide nitrogen source, as I just mentioned. And it did not receive uh, any additional external amendment the organic manure system features a much longer eight-year rotation, including three years hay, uh, orchard grass, and alfalfa. So the alfalfa are grown to feed the cows, and the manure of the cows are put back to the soil. So this is to close the nutrient cycle, uh, nutrient loop. So we can see that after a few, uh, after the first few years decline in yield uh, in the organic systems. So over the last 40 years, there's no statistical difference in the yield between the organic manure and the, organic, and the conventional system. So uh, the, that means organic manure and the conventional system, they can provide the similar amount of yield across the 40 years. But there was, we admit that was, there was a, a first five years yield decline in organic systems because it was kind of weaned from the chemicals. So it took a few years for the biology to restore. And if you look at the revenues and the profits, you can see the organic system um, much more profitable because there's a, we know that there's a price premium of the organic produce. And we can see the soils have become much more different right now. The organic soils now are much darker than the conventional soils and Organic soils can hold together in the water. Well, the soils under the conventional management just uh, don't hold together in the water. And in the years with extreme weather events, for example, drought, we see we have seen that the organic systems can provide as much as thirty percent more yield than the conventional system. That shows that the organic systems are more resi resilient in, in, in scenarios of climate change. If we're going to face more and more, fre more frequent climate extremes, then this is what's going to happen. The conventional chemically based system will not be able to provide a very stable yield under those extreme scenarios, but organic systems can. 
And this is how the different system looked like in 2016, uh, a very dry year. You probably can remember that. That was a time I was still in Australia. And so organic matter, so organic carbon changes over, over the 40 years. You can see that in the beginning, in the 1981, the three systems had similar organic matter content. But then organic uh, systems had seen a, a gradual increase in soil organic matter or soil carbon. And we, we think that's because that the microbial uh, communities, now we increasingly know that soil microbes, the biology are the one who sequester carbon. What happens is that uh, increased diversity and the population of soil microbes, they become, they, they are more efficient in processing the organic input from the plant in organic systems to form the stable carbon in organo mineral associations. So that's why we see there's a differentiation in soil organic matter, soil organic carbon content in the, between the organic and the conventional systems. Well, in the conventional system, because the plants, they just rely on the synthetic NPK as their majority of their um, um, fertility source. So the plants, they don't have strong roots. They don't have to work with the microbes to get the nutrients. As a result, there's a large loss of carbon as well as nutrient, including nitrogen, lost as uh, things like nitrous oxide and nitri nitrate leaching leached to the groundwater and also phosphorus runoff. So in organic systems, we have a closer nutrient loop mediated by the microbes, which facilitates soil carbon sequestration. That's what the long-term trial has taught us. And in the history of the farming system trial, there has been management shift that represents the recent development of agriculture in the United States. So for example, now conventional farmers, they are now adopting the so-called no-till or conservation to stop the till in the soil, to use more herbicides, for example, uh, Roundup to, to kill weeds. So in 2008, we divided both the, uh, all these three systems into till and no-till. So that means before 2008, all three systems were managed in the same tillage intensity. Uh, but then in 2008, we separated each of them into till and no-till. In a conventional system, no-till is achieved by using chemical pesticides and herbicides. And in the organic system, the no-till is achieved by using innovative tools such as the roller crimper designed by Roda Institute. We use the residues of cover crops to control weeds. So we were able to, to no-till and, and without using the chemicals. Also, since 2014, a conservation conventional uh, component has been added to some of the conventional plots. That means uh, adding a cover crop into the corn and soybean rotation. So that's what uh, now some conventional farmers claim to be conservation or uh, no-till farmers. So what happens that in 2016, this is very uh, representative. In 2016, we see that in organic systems, the organic no-till reached a record high corn yield about 200 bushels per acre. That's even very high even for the conventional settings. But we didn't see the conventional, the, the, in the conventional system, no-till had such benefit. We found the conventional no-till was probably one of the worst, the worst system. And if you walked on the field, in a field, you can see the soils in a conventional system, especially on the no chemical no-till system, so it's a very compacted. And if you look at the soil carbon, we can see that that's the difference between these three systems, right? We have talked about that. Conventional has the lowest carbon and organic manure has the highest carbon content. But whether no-till or chemically based no-till can improve the carbon in a conventional system, 
we didn't see that. We didn't see the, uh, a benefit of sort of carbon in the conventional system under no-till. So that means no-till or cover cropping alone did not increase soil carbon in a chemical-based simplified conventional system. So uh, really it's about the holistic systems approach. So you really need to, you know, to use all the tools and change your system, including in eliminating your chemical, chemical input and adopting no-till. That's why we see there's an increase of a carbon in the organic system on the no-till in an organic manure system. So how do we do the organic no-till system? That's the question. I talked about the roller crimper. You probably have seen the picture of that. So what we do is that in the fall, we plant the annual cover crop. For example, here you can see the cereal rye planted in September. And in the next spring, we terminate the cover crops mechanically using the roller crimper and plant the cash crops into the residues of the cover crops. So what the roller crimper does is that it has a chevron uh, patterned blade so it can, it can crimp, it can crimp the stems of the cover crop every a few inches. So the cover crop will be killed, but they are still connected, the stems are still connected, lying on the ground. So they can stay in place and gradually decay and still perform, uh, provide a weed control for the cash crop. For example, you, here you can see between the soybean rows, these are the residues of the cereal rye cover crops. Over time, they become a weed suppression, suppressing mulch. So this is a zero chemical, chemical free system, almost perfect weed control. So that's what we want to see, the organic no-till system. That's how it's achieved. But also we have to admit that things may not always be perfect. For example, in the, in, the, in, the, in the picture on the right hand side, there might be weeds coming from between the, either between the row or in a row. So then organic farmers or regenerative organic farmers really need to keep all the options open. And what we do here at Rodale Institute is to keep refining and improving organic no-till system by trying and testing out all these different tools chemical free tools. For example, the high residue cultivator. High residue cultivator is designed to, to cultivate just beneath, just beneath the cover crop residues. So it has minimal disturbance to the soil, but can rid, get, rid of, get rid of the weeds coming between the rows, but also not, uh, not keeping all the cover crop residues in place. Minimal disturbance and can adapt to the high residue field conditions. And the flame weeder or a weed zapper. These are uh, chem uh, chemical free uh, or, or zero disturbance to the soil. But we have to say that they also use energy, right? So energy consumption is another thing. And the weed puller is something to get rid of the weeds from inner roads. For example, if they're uh, weeds coming out of the soybean rows. How can you get rid of that? So you can use the weed puller to pull the weeds out. So the, the idea is that you really want to keep all your, all your options open. And when things happen, you have the tools to, 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 to remedy. Okay, now, now we can take a look at this spectrum of the agricultural practices. So on the left-hand side, it's the more degenerative agricultural practice. On the right-hand side, it becomes more regenerative. So we have the conventional systems or two conventional system on the left-hand side. And then when you adopt a no-till in a conventional system, it may do good, good, some good for the soil because it can provide erosion. It can provide erosion, uh, erosion control and prevent erosion and a runoff happening after the season. And if, uh, if you plant a cover crop, that will be even better in preventing erosion. 
And when you adopt, when you transition to organic, then you move further to the regenerative side. And when you are able to really do the regenerative organic no-till system, that's how you are getting really closer to the real regenerative. So we really need to gradually move uh, from the conventional side of the spectrum to the more regenerative side of the spectrum. And that's why, that's why it's so important to think about the, the, the place of farming and soil uh, when, we, when we think about planetary health, because our human civilizations are really built on the basis of these natural systems. Um, and, and, and we really rely on these resources to, to sustain our human civilization. So that's all for today. I, I thank you again for your attention. I hope you enjoyed the talk. And now I'm ready to take any question that you will have about this talk. Thank you. Dr. Ray, thank you so much. That was uh, uh, absolutely amazing. And I know that we're just scratching the surface. Um, no, no pun intended on that. Um, we've got a number of questions I'm gonna start rolling through here. And so uh, two that are related. And uh, so the, the one question is the, the flame weeder. Is there any studies that have been done on the flame weeder that indicate that uh, the heat decreases the soil microbe fauna? I, I don't think there has been any research down it's still pretty new. Yeah, at Rodea, we've been doing two years research, but we're mostly looking at how effectively the flame weeder is, can terminate the cover crops and terminate the cover crops and kill the weeds. For soil microbes, I don't think that's gonna be a problem because soil microbes are extremely resilient. You know, the temperature fluctuation from summertime to wintertime can be much larger. And the really important thing for, camp for the soil microbe is that the right chemical environment and the right amount of energy source, which means organic matter. So we really want to you know, provide the food for the microbes. So they will be able to adapt to any environmental changes and bounce back quickly after perturbations. Yeah. And so here's another one that I think is related. Um, you showed that there was a, a difference in the carbon soil carbon stock in the legume till treatment versus the no-till treatment. And um, some of our, our viewers were surprised to see that there was less soil carbon in the no-till treatment. Is that because of the increase in chemical use in the no-till? That's, I think that's, that, that's something related to the spatial variability. That's just one time sampling. Okay. Uh, if we look at a more long-term um, trend, we will see that the, that's sometimes not the case. So the legume system has, um, still, has less carbon than the manure system, but it's still a little bit better than a conventional system. But we have to keep in mind that the legume system did not have any input in the last 40 years. So you keep extracting things from the soil when you uh, harvest when you harvest the biomass and the grains but you're not putting things back only rely on the the leguminous cover crops to provide the the the, the fertility source so the legume system was designed to really to 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 show to test or to test whether a zero input system can can succeed. Our, I think the message is clear. For legume system, the answer is no, because you really need to put things back to the soil to close the loop. And for the manure system, organic manure system, where you have the composted manure coming back to the soil to feed soil microbes and, and to, to improve, keep improving the organic matter, the answer is yes. Great. So related, um, earlier in the presentation, uh, you showed a relate what appears to be a relationship between a decrease in nutrients in food and correlate, correlated uh, increases in, in various disease processes and illnesses in humans. Is that uh, correlational or causal? 
It's a correlation. Correlation. A lot of things, the things that a lot of these things are happening at the same time. So unless you conduct those very strictly controlled experiment on human diet and monitor their health status for many years, you'll not be able to find a causation in this case. So this is just a correlation. But I think it tells us something. So <clears throat> looking at the bigger picture, um, what are the biggest impediments to having farmers move from conventional ag to regen regenerative ag? And related, I've got somebody here, Joe, who is a small farming operation, very interested in adopting best practices in regenerative ag organic farming. What are the best resources or current uh, currently available for a small scale farmer? So to your first question, I think the real challenge is that for the conventional farmers, the, the, what they really need is they need to be able to profit when transitioned when transitioning to organic. If, they're not, if they are not able to stay in the business, then what's the point of doing this whole thing, right? So they need support to find a stable um, 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 uh, and um, they need to be able to sell their produce before they, they plan anything. So if they know they're going to make that money, I think there's much more confidence. That's the thing for transitioning. We really need to incent incentivize the, you know, our system and food production systems to reward the farmers mm -hmm. who are doing good things and producing good food. Mm -hmm. They can make money and there's no way that we can achieve the, all those benefits. And for the sec to the second question about uh, the resources of local farm, um, uh, local uh, uh, small scale farms, Rodal Institute has training programs, both in person and also online courses. So if you're interested, please go to rodalinstitute.org to find more information about our in-person training pro farmer training programs uh, uh, in which we teach how to, you know, uh, grow vegetables and start and maintain small scale business and other things like, you know, farm markets or those things. But also we have uh, just released a online course transition into organic. So you can take that course and, and learn those things remotely. Great. And then two questions related to, to manure. Um, <clears throat> If the manure system is still best for organic farming and vegetables, must we still have animals in the process? Yes, I think so. There's been a lot of you know discussion or question about the veganic or you know the the these kind of thing. I personally think animals they should always have a place in our natural systems because they have been around, you know with humans for thousands or millions of years, they've always had a place in this co-evolution. So they co-evolved with humans. For example, the grass, the prairie grass in the large areas of the you know, central United States, how did they evolve? How did the soil form, the very rich mollusks form, form in that circumstance? Animals, for example, bisons played a role so if you, you take that out of the context, you're not gonna you know, mimic the natural conditions, which is designed by nature to reach that goal. So I personally think animals always have a you know, place in, in, in our you know, regenerative agriculture. Yeah, and then, and, and then how do we manage the negative effects from manure that we see regularly on our waterways? Yeah, that's the thing, what we want to, we want to keep you know, refining uh, the regenerative agriculture. There are researchers, for example, in University of Wisconsin Madison, that are doing things like you know reduce the environmental footprint, or you know those you know nitrate leaching or phosphorus loading into waterways. So that's for sure very important for agriculture. So we need to keep keep doing that. I'm not an expert in that, but I think that's very important. I'm sure there are a lot of great people doing that work. 
Yeah. And don't we also see negative effects from chemical fertilizers hitting our waterways as well? Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's what we have found at, uh, at Rodeo Institute. We currently work with Stroud Water Research Center on a project uh, founded by the William Penn Foundation. So to, to, to monitor the agriculture pollutions from our farming systems to local waterways and to the Delaware River watershed. So what we found is that the conventional system have much greater, much greater uh, nutrient, nutrient nitrate leaching into our waterways and also those pesticides, of course, right? Yeah. No pesticide in organic system. Organic system rely on the biological process of nitrification to, to get the nitrogen cycling going. And there is a little bit nitri nitrate leaching into the waterways, but not at the scale compared to the conventional, not even close. Excellent. So how respect, in, in your experience, how receptive are Pennsylvania and specifically Lancaster farmers uh, to this concept? And uh, shifting a little bit away from, from agricultural land use to more of a homeowner suburban land use, what recommendations do you have for small backyard um, uh, gardeners and homeowners? Well, I think they, are, they play a very important role in this regenerative journey because when we talk about, when we talk about regenerative agriculture, Farmers are important. Of course, farmers, you know, they're very important in this, in this job. But I think everyone should be, you know, joining this journey. We need to get everybody going. We need to get everybody motivated and do, doing good things in this journey. For example, right now, a lot of the agricultural uh, products are exported from our rural region, from our farms to the cities, to the urban areas. <clears throat> Where do they end up? They end up in landfills or trash cans. Can we reduce that? Can we put them back to the soil? Yes, we can. Uh, about you know, 80% or 85%, I don't remember the exact number, about 85% of Americans' life waste is easily compostable. Why can't we you know, compost that in our, in our backyard and put it into the soil so we can sequester a little bit carbon in every backyard? We can do that. Yeah, excellent. And I think that's, I apologize that we are, we're out of time and I didn't get to everybody's questions. So um, please, Dr. Ray, if you're okay, we'll, uh, we'll have this posted, I believe, Kelly, uh, a couple days, uh, days from now. And uh, folks can contact Rodale with their additional questions. But, you know, thank you so much. And that last point that you made is really critical. I think we all have a role in this. And so when we look at these enormous global problems of loss of biodiversity and soil health, and climate and carbon sequestration and the role that soil can play, we all have a, a little patch of ground that we can take better care of and increase its capacity to sequester carbon. You know, just like the Conservancy, we have over 7,000 acres that we stored that are these great carbon sinks among all the other positive things that that preserved land does, does for us as humans. Um, in addition to protecting biodiversity, it serves as a carbon sink. And in those patches of wild spaces are part of this bigger patchwork of a working landscape and if everybody within that landscape just did their part to improve soil health, think about what we, had, we could accomplish together. So Dr. Ray, once again, thank you so much for this mind boggling, uh, just amazing uh, presentation with some really good practical takeaways. And thank you all for tuning in tonight. Please remember the upcoming uh, nature hours that we have through the rest of, of this uh, wintertime season before spring. And please think about joining us for those. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Keith.